Uh, hello, welcome to tonight's session on uh, slashies, on, on multi-hyphenates, on, on whatever you want to call them, people who don't just do uh, one thing. I'm Ed Gove, I'm a journalist at Channel 4 News, and so over the next hour we'll be hearing from a bunch of very talented people, slashies of all stripes, uh, on how they do their jobs, what exactly their jobs are, and why they, why they do so many of them, really. Um, if you're new to RTS Futures, uh, then welcome. Uh, we hold free monthly events uh, on a range of topics for graduates and early careers uh, starters. Um, we'll look at everything from drama, comedy, journalism, reality, TV, and through those events, hopefully we'll help you get started in your careers. So uh, if this is your first RTS session, um, then we would love to see you at some more. Uh, so let's get started. And as we go, please send in any questions that you've got using the, the Q&A function at the bottom. And we'll read those out as we go. So to our panelists, um, we've got an awful lot of job titles in it rolled into four people. We've got uh, producers, writers, actors, directors, podcast hosts, authors, um, We've got controller of content services at ITV. We've got uh, columnists, I believe, as well. Um, so let's start with Helen Simmons. Helen is a writer, a producer, and runs Erebus. Did I say that right? Yeah. Erebus production, uh, Pictures. It's a production company. She's produced three feature films and has TV projects in development uh, for companies including NBC Universal, World Productions, and Kinetic Content. Uh, so Helen, let's start with you. Uh, why so busy? Why, why do you do so much? <laughs> the question my husband asks all the time. Um, I, I, it was sort of just a progression. It wasn't really a planned thing. It just was, it, it was where my interests led me. And, and I think that's maybe going to be a common theme that you kind of don't strategize to take on all these roles and labels, but when you find yourself working with other people or trying new things or even circumstances kind of forcing your hand you you end up doing them so I feel like it's it's never been a plan to kind of adopt different titles and roles it's just been something that's happened to me a happy accident yeah yeah fantastic well thank you for being here um next uh to Kim Sir Kezi did I get that right Oh, it's really good, Ed. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, RTS award-winning actor, a producer, a writer, and a presenter. And you were named one of the 100 most influential disabled people in the UK by the Shaw Trust. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, Kim, you're, you know, one of those things as an actor. You played the iconic uh, Penny Pocket in Balamora. Um, do you think of yourself as an actor first and everything else second, or, or are you all things at all times? Oh, I used to think I was an actor first and foremost. Um, but no, as, as time has evolved and I've got an opportunity to try other roles, um, no, I'm, I'm definitely a slasher now. I'm across various roles and responsibilities all of the time. Exhausting, but fun, I guess. It's brilliant. <laughs> well, we'll hear a lot about it, I hope. Uh, Sunny? Uh, Sunny Hanley, ITV's controller of content services, slash, this is the all important slash, co chair of ITV Embrace. And you've been with the broadcaster for 18 years across technical uh, production roles and operations roles. Um, you have done a lot of different things in your career, jumping around between these different bits. How, why have you done so much changing, and has it been difficult to move between different areas? Um, well, I've done a lot of changing because I, I kind of love what I do. Uh, I, I love everything about TV. Uh, I, so, you know, the, when, you, when you do a job and you, you kind of look sideways and you see other jobs that could interest you, you kind of want to try and try your hand at that. And um, I've pretty much done that for the like, last 18 years, kind of always kept a lookout and um, not just stayed in my bubble, if you like. Um, uh, and, but it comes down to loving what you do. Yeah. I think that's it, isn't it? I mean, you know, we've got to love our jobs. Um, and then last and not least, certainly, uh, Dr. Ranj Singh, ITV's, uh, ITV This Morning's medical expert, TV presenter, podcast host, author, Strictly Come Dancing sensation. Um, and sometimes, you know, somehow squeezing in being a practicing NHS clinician. Um, 
how do you juggle a career in telly with one outside of telly? It feels like a lot. <laughs> it does when you say it out loud, but it never feels like a lot in practice, which is interesting. And, and I'm echoing what Helen said there, you never plan for it, it just kind of happens. You know, you, you fall into these various roles and because you, you like them, they fit and they stick. And, um, and, and we're all really, really, I think, fortunate to be able to do things that we really love and enjoy. Um, how do I balance them? Probably not very well, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, people talk about a work-life balance. I have a work, work, work life balance. So, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm always trying to find that balance, especially coming, you know, back into a what whatever normality we're coming back into uh, at this end of the COVID pandemic. Um, but yeah, I, I, I guess I just. The, the 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 joy of it is that it doesn't always feel like work which is fantastic and which is that's when you know when you found something that is right um and 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 it's just you know experience as much of that joy as you possibly can and then everything kind of seems to just drop into place so that's why i'm kind of running with it for now <laughs> yeah i think that's that's the point right is is um you know, you guys are all saying that the, these uh, opportunities that have arisen, you've seized them, and now all of a sudden you're, you're a slashy of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, maybe Helen, from you, uh, what was what 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 was the progression for you? Where did you start, and what what was your first slash? Mm -hmm. um, I suppose my first slash was producing. But I kind of came to it through. I was I was studying history at university, and I took on running a um, a student film festival called Water Sprite and I think I sort of saw it actually now I look back it started at a young age of like as soon as I felt like someone was boxing me or something I would do something else and so I I had done like lots of other things and societies and stuff and then I took over this festival and I just thought this is amazing and I'd always been a fan of well a, a big avid watcher of films and thought that that looked like a great career but not known how it might happen um, and so running this festival was different to producing a movie, but it was kind of similar skill set. Um, and so off the back of that, I tried lots of different roles within the industry and then started to produce my own stuff, starting with short films and, and then progressing to a micro budget feature and then into bigger features and, and TV and stuff. So producing was where I started. And I think... I'm, I'm glad that I kind of took my time coming to writing because I think it allowed me to just read a lot and to learn a lot and see other people doing that job and work with other writers and figure out actually if I am going to do it what is my voice and what is the stuff that I'm going to be interested in doing um, and I think the one the one thing that people always say is oh when you try something new oh so you're going to abandon the other thing but actually no like the passion for that is still just as strong and I think it's then about how do you juggle which was obviously an ongoing thing to practice but um yeah that was the start was producing and then writing kind of slowly started creeping in and becoming now it's much more kind of 50 50. And I guess for you Kim as an actor um does having that experience as an actor help you when you're, for example, writing something? You know, you've you've got the experience of delivering those lines, you know. Yes. That... Yes, absolutely. I mean, I started off acting really, and that was my absolute passion, what I wanted to do. But then as a disabled actor, especially, I found the roles that were coming my way were just really pitiful awful stereotypical portrayals of disabled people you know at the point I stopped auditioning and it got so bad so I thought the way forward for me was to try and create those roles myself so that's how I kind of moved into writing and producing um so I for me I feel they all interplay with each other and the skills I've developed in each of those make me stronger you know in in the other areas so you know having had some experience writing now I feel I know the importance of giving 
notes as a producer, you know, how important it is to give good notes to a writer. And, you know, actors, you know, if I'm auditioning, I want to make sure there's cups of tea and biscuits there for actors, you know, and it's important, you know, and people, you know, what your actors go through for that auditioning process, just don't get half the recognition they should. Um, so it's all those things, that awareness of the different roles in the industry, if you can take part in those, I think it makes you stronger across the board. Mm -hmm. And Sonny, for you, as you've moved around in, in your career to different bits, um, have you found there's sort of any, like a common thread, if you like, that runs through your skill set that's enabled you to just turn your hand to, well, it sounds like quite a lot. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I first started, I started as a production coordinator, but I was always really interested in the other roles within TV, you know, the... Um, uh, and I got the opportunity to sit in an edit once when I was a production coordinator. I thought, actually, I could probably do both of these roles. Um, and so I became a production coordinator slash edit assistant. So I was a production coordinator during the day. I would go home, I would have some food, I would come back at 10 o'clock and I would do edit assisting, just digitizing tapes for the edit the next morning until four in the morning. Then I would go home, sleep. So I was doing, I was doing two jobs, but... It, like Dr. Ryan said, it didn't feel like work at the time. It felt exciting and it felt new and um, and I was learning so much. So, you know, being a slashy, uh, as you guys say, um, was brilliant. It was such a great opportunity. And I think that sort of work ethic of wanting to know what's going on over there or wanting to know what's in that role or wanting to do that or wanting to learn more just kind of helped me in my career because the next move was up was easy because I kind of knew a bit more than the next person, if you like. So I've always kind of thought ahead in terms of wanting to know more outside of just my role. Mm. And is that for, for you, Ranj, is that how it worked? Because, you know, you've said these, you'd never planned to do all of these things. They just, you know, evolved. Um, but, you know, there's evolving and evolving. You know, if you start as a clinician at a children's hospital and then end up as ITV's medical expert, you know, what happened there? How does that work? Exactly, I, don't, I have no idea. Um, I, I, so obviously I have a very, I would say, conservative day job. There's like a route into it and there's a route that everybody takes as, you know, as you progress through it and there's a done orthodox sort of way of doing, conventional way of doing it is what I mean. And then I kind of branched off and everyone was like, what the hell is he doing? And, but I branched off because I needed something to kind of shake things up a little bit. And um, so I was working as a junior doctor. I, I just saw this advert um, come up that the BBC were looking for a young people's doctor just to advise them on stuff. And I thought, you know, it's kind of my day job. Um, so tell you what, it's something a bit different, something a bit more creative. It sort of scratches that creative itch. I'm just going to have a go. And that's basically been my motto my entire career. I'll have a go and see what happens. So <laughs> that kind of led me down. The, the, the funny thing with telly is I, I, I literally started with zero knowledge of the industry. I didn't know how anything worked or how anything was done. You know, I had that sort of glamorous, oh, it must be really glitzy, shiny, sparkly telly. And it's really not, there's a lot more hard work than people know. Um, so much goes on. But I kind of went in and just kind of gave it a shot. And then my name got passed around and then more things started to crop up. And I did more and more projects as time went on. And then more and more opportunities presented themselves as I went along. And like I said, I don't, people, some people are wonderful. They have like five year plans. I'm lucky if I have a five day plan. I'm kind of like, just about know what I'm going to be doing next week. I'm not going to plan anything just in case. Um, because I, I, I think the, the key for me has been to, if an opportunity comes along, um, no matter what, grab it and just see what happens because you never know what door it will open. And I remember when I first started doing stuff in television, um, I was just doing stuff for free for the joy of it because it was fun. It was something different. I needed an outlet. My day job was really, really like wearing me down. It was knackering. And so I was like, right, I need to do something that borrows from my day job that I can kind of take a piece of and maybe spin it into something else. And that's kind of where I went. And I just kind of ran with it and thought, let's see what happens. <laughs> and, and, you know, 10, 15, maybe 12 years later, maybe even longer than that, um, I, it's now become a, a, a career. What kind of turned into, initially cropped up as something I was just kind of dipping my toes into. 
just for a bit of an outlet um actually you know grew into something a lot more substantial that i i absolutely love doing and it sounds a lot like you know when you started when you started just seeing where it went um opportunities started coming to you and so i guess what i'd like to hear from all of you and maybe i'll start with uh let's go to kim uh, how much is sort of building those connections in your career um in some ways almost as important as having the skills to back them up um, for instance, if you're, you know, if you're looking at doing some production work, having never done that, um, do you think having a good relationship with somebody in the industry can really help? Yeah, I mean, networking is so important in this industry. We, we all know that. And just being able to bounce around ideas with someone else. This, this is why I also love co-writing and co-producing. I love collaboration. And I think for me, that is the way forward always in projects. So I think it's important to share experiences and constantly be learning from other people. So, you know, I would I always love to get, get to as many events as I can to meet people because there's always that chance to learn all the time. And it, and it does the connections. It's amazing how they, they happen and you know, someone I was connected with then introduced me to Helen recently, and now we're working on this fantastic project together. And, you know, I, things are happening are sort of beyond my wildest dreams in some respects on that project. So you just don't know what comes from it, but always just get out there and meet people and connect with people. Um, and I think now we're online, it's so much easier to do, you know, as someone up in the Northeast, I've often felt quite isolated from some of that networking. You know, having to travel a lot of it has taken place in this industry in London, and I always felt like I was missing out. But Zoom now, since COVID, strangely, has opened opened the industry up to me more. So I'm now connecting with people not just in London and other parts of the country, but internationally as well, and building new relationships in America and. Um, so yeah you just never know what's coming next from a contact and for you know if you're a you know very new to the industry and you might feel like you just don't know how to start you know i guess it's how do you get that ball rolling the ball you know how do you find that first opportunity where do you, you know where do those opportunities come from if you're if you're very new to this yeah i think um it's it's kind of finding you know the training opportunities you know that are out there and um you know taking advantage of all those opportunities if you can it's um it's not always easy um things get in the way for people to be able to do those things um and just i think you know when i started out i don't know how many you know it was pre probably pre-email and all that i don't know how many letters i wrote reaching out to people saying what i wanted to do and could you help me i think don't be worried about asking for help and asking people to talk to you, ask people to give you their time. You know, the amount of people that did that for me um, when I was starting out, and I like to think I try and do that as much as possible. Now for other people, I get emails from people, can I ask you advice? Can I sound you out about um, opportunities? Um, so I think, you know, get out there and just and ask people, don't be worried to ask for help and advice. Um, and just take try to connect with as many networks as possible, I think, and it will just snowball uh, really quickly. You'll be passed everywhere and you'll start to get to know people. But we all started, you know, obviously not knowing anyone and not knowing anything. We've all been there. So and, and, and I still feel like I'm there a lot of the time because I'm always wanting to know more and do new things. So it's, yeah, we've just got to all try and keep talking to each other. Mm. It's yes. true, when, when you're starting out, like, sorry to, to jump in on there, Ed, um, when you're starting out, because you don't, from my experience, because you don't really know, well, I didn't really know anything at all. I was just open to possibility and, and up for trying things. And uh, I think the thing that kind of made people pass my name around wasn't that I was clever. <laughs> I knew what I was talking about. I think it was the fact that I was keen and that they could work with me and they were like okay here's somebody who's who's trying who's interested who's up for it um uh who we can you know potentially use or and, and that's how you build those connections 
And the other big thing is just being nice to people. It's so important. People will not remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And that's so true, you know, and it, it's stuff like that, that people will remember you and say, oh, I worked with so-and-so. Do you know what? They'd be perfect over here. Or they'll recommend you to somebody. Um, I think not enough can be said about that, really, about, about just being nice to other people and treating people with respect and, and, and valuing what they bring. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of sort of historic, toxic ideas about how to be successful in something like the media is you have to be really hard nosed and you have to be horrible. And, you know, it's all about the egos and the auteurs. And I just don't think that's true. And I think actually, you know, if you've got two people equally talented or with the same CVs, or even actually the, somebody who's slightly less experienced, if they're nice and they're a pleasure to work with every single time, yeah. that's who you'll go with. And I think it's starting to change as well slowly but surely that you know we people will share um stories if they're negative and will be honest about bad experiences so i think it's absolutely like fundamentally the the big thing to think about starting out just being a nice person yeah yeah so it's it's about uh, sort of see, being nice and seizing opportunities when when they come up and i think you know sunny that was one of the things that you were talking about um that you'd seen this and thought hey I can do I can do this job as well. Um, how much of your career would you say is just dependent on that mindset of oh, I reckon I could do that? Uh, I think most of my career is probably based on be, being nice um, and treating every day as a job interview because you never know who you're going to meet, you never know who you're going to run into, you never know who's going to. Uh, recommend you to the next person that they meet to say oh i've met that you know that person before and they were great to work with like dr ram said so um you kind of have to be ready for the, those opportunities when when they present themselves um or you know create those opportunities you know seeing an area that you want to move into and spending some time in there and um you know it, it's it's a sad fact but sometimes you know i in my career i've had to work for free uh, i think dr ram said it uh, as well you know, because, but I didn't see it as working. I saw it as gaining uh, insight and an opportunity. And um, and I think it's so important to kind of not take your eye off kind of what you really want and and, and keep going and uh, and pushing yourself. Um, and, and that's what I would kind of owe my career to. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, seeing something and, and sort of pursuing it, I guess. And, and, you know, it's not just about taking opportunities, it's about sometimes making opportunities a little bit. And I think, you know, uh, one of the things that is probably worth saying is that you know you shouldn't um, be you know working for free is 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 not the end game you know it, it's it's a, a means to an end I think. Um, Helen, one of the things that I saw you spoke about recently, I saw you tweeted, is that the stress of writing cancels out the stress of producing. Uh, how how much and I'll come to all of you, but how much for you is is that one of the real attractions of of being basically a slashy? Yeah, it's, a, it's not something I thought would happen. And sometimes you have a day where like the stress of both just compiles and you're like, why am I doing all this? But a lot of the time, I think when you're doing things which are very different, um, it just kind of, it's like a palate cleanser and you can then come back to the other thing refreshed. And I think you've, I definitely find that I now, I mean, it's probably not good. I should be better at like downtime, but I'm not very good at procrastinating. Instead, what I do is like flip from one thing to the other thing. So you end up actually getting more done than if you were just doing the one, because you have some, you know, like the same thing again and again, there's different challenges. So with producing, you might just be, you know, fed up with having constant phone calls and emails and difficult conversations or budgets, whatever it might be. Um, and if that's all you're doing, then you just like, well, I can't do this anymore. I'm gonna go and watch TV or whatever. Whereas if you can say, actually, I'm now gonna turn and just like put some music on and get in a creative space, and work on this script that's that's a joy <laughs> because you're doing something different and then when you you get writer's block or whatever on that then you switch back and I think that's a really amazing thing that you can sort of refresh yourself through your work not to become like a workaholic but I, but it is <laughs> it is a nice thing when you enjoy what you're doing um that they feed into one another and it's it's yeah it's, it's actually like a weird nice effect from doing those two things 
yeah, sleeping and time off are unnecessary extras. <laughs> um, uh, Kim, I guess, you know, acting, acting versus producing and, um, and, and writing, you know, some of the, like, writing you can just get on with. Um, you don't need to be hired for it. So how much is it useful for you as an actor, partly an actor, um, to, have, to have these other strings to your bow, I guess? Ah, oh, so useful. Honestly, as an actor, it's, it's excruciating waiting for the agent to call. It, it, it is. And, you know, knowing that you can fill those gaps with creativity and productivity, that's what I love about it. It, it you know, why are you waiting for that phone to ring? And I'm always waiting for that phone to ring, always excited for the next acting role. I can just get on. And, and like Helen said, I mean, everything Helen said was so spot on. Just, you know, to, it's great to be able to explore different sides of yourself, that kind of strategic, organized, planning side as producer, and then the creativity and that different mindset as a, as a writer. Um, I love to have different spaces to work as well, you know, in, in my office, I find that helps me. I'm lucky enough to have an, an office big enough to do it, but I like, I'll have a space where I like to write and a space where I like to do the emails and the more business. And, and I do, I literally will take myself to a, it can be as simple as that, take myself to a different desk, different space in the room. And then I'm like, right, producer now, you know, over on that side of the room, writer. And it, it, that really helps me. Um, but yeah, definitely the other, the other sides of the work I do help, um, you know, you know, it makes those calls when you get, you know, get those, eventually get the call from your agent to say there's an acting audition coming even more exciting because you haven't been <laughs> expecting it or just sitting all day waiting for it. Yeah. Uh, Sunny, you, so you're, you know, in, a, in conjunction with, you know, your, your work as uh, controller of content services, you're also co-chair of ITV Embrace. How do those two sort of pair together at the moment? Do you find that actually it's a bit of a respite to jump from one to the other? Uh, it, you know, it's difficult. Uh, and this is probably the most difficult year for, um, because of the pandemic, because of uh, the killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. So that we've had to provide a lot of support for uh, uh, ITV colleagues around those, those areas. So I've been tremendously busy trying to make myself available for anybody who wants kind of support and wants to, you know, um, unload their feelings or what they're going through. Um, it's been a, quite a, um, uh, a, a painful journey for some people this last 12, 18 months. Um, so kind of juggling that with the kind of the day job of being a controller of content services has been difficult at times. Uh, but it's actually very rewarding to be there for somebody um, who is going through a, a difficult period, uh, navigating the pandemic as well as uh, what's going on in the news. And, you know, and it seems to be that every couple of months um, you, you feel that you're kind of getting back on track or people will feel that they're getting back on track and then something will come along and it'll throw them off, whether it's, um, you know, England players getting uh, abuse uh, at the Euros or um, Piers Morgan um, getting in trouble for uh, the things that he said about Meghan. Um, you know, every time something comes along, it kind of sets people back. So it means that we as a network, me as a co-chair, become increasingly busy uh, and have to juggle that with the day job. But it is very, very re rewarding. Uh, and I do enjoy what I do. Mm. So I guess sort of the, the, the follow up question to that, which I'll, I'll, I'll send across to you, Raj, is, uh, is, is burnout. You know, if you're doing so much, like, you know, you may be loving every second of it, but sometimes you do just need a rest. And does... Do, is there a risk of you guys doing too much, basically? Yeah, so I actually did burn out at one point. Um, a few years back, uh, I think I just took on too much. It was, um, and it took a while to recognize it and it took a while to accept it and acknowledge it, that it happened. Um, and particularly being somebody who's supposed to look after other people and supposed to be advising them on their well-being suddenly having to be mindful of your own as well. It was a bit of a wake up call, but it's true. It's like Helen was saying, you know, it, it's great when you, when you have a multifaceted job, I call it portfolio career, whatever it might be. It's so easy to um, forget about downtime, to forget about having space and silence. Um, I, I, I love Michaela's 
Cole's quote the other day from the Emmys where she said, don't be scared to wait and see what comes to you in the silence because we feel like we always have to be around and visible and on and doing stuff. And I think as slashies as we were, we're probably guilty of doing stuff all the time. You know, I use my um, media role to take a break from my medical role. And sometimes my medical role to take a break from my media role. And then I forget to take a break. Um, and I think what my burnout taught me was actually, you can't say yes to everything. You are only human, you have to pace yourself. And sometimes to give 100%, you can't do everything. You actually have to cut back and do 70% to give 100%. Um, and I think we all have to be mindful of that, no matter what stage of career you're in, especially when you're just starting out and you wanna just say yes to everything and try and get involved in as much as you can. Remember to pace yourself. And sometimes it's about quality, not quantity. Um, but yeah, there, there, is a, there is a real risk. And I think especially in this day and age when it's more acceptable for people to be multi-hyphenates. It's much more of a done thing. Um, you know, you, people aren't necessarily just going down one career path. Um, they are being brave and trying other things at the same time. And that's fantastic. But just remember that you have to make sure that you're giving yourself enough oxygen, as well as all of these projects that you're a part of, that you may be loving and enjoying and being fantastic at. Don't ever forget in a non-selfish way to look after yourself as well. And I guess, you know, especially, well, I mean, at any point in your career, but when you're getting started, there's that feeling of urgency of, you know, of, of missing the vote. So how do you recognise that, that you're pushing yourself too hard? It, it, it can manifest itself in various ways. I myself found um, I was getting a lot more, I was starting to get anxious at times. I was getting very angry about things. Uh, I was late to everything. Uh, I was just exhausted. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it, I, I, I'd stopped experiencing the joy that I was getting before. And I was like, hang on a second, what's changed? What has happened that's made me not like what I'm doing anymore? And I, I had to sit down and say, you, you're just doing too much. You're doing too much and you're going to have to step back a little bit. And don't see that as a weakness, stepping back. Sometimes stepping back is, is, is a strength to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would add to that, like, you know, when, when it stops being fun, <laughs> that's when you, you need to stop, you know. So, you know, I, I told um, what, uh, the story of when I first started in my career doing, you know, the days and nights, but genuinely it, it felt like fun, you know, like le learning. But, um, you know, if that was to kind of manifest itself now and it stops being fun, I, I would recognise that. So, um you know, I think um, I think it's gambling away. Kind of have the phrase when the fun stops, stop. Yeah. And I think that's quite a good, you know, slogan because yeah. that it's so true that if you don't, you can burn out, and and it can creep up on you and become the new normal. And before you know it, you know, it, it all falls down. Yeah, Helen, for you, how um do you do you juggle these things? You know, do you have you had a sort of reckoning of the kind that you know Rand is talking about, and and how did you overcome that? I think they sort of crop up like annually maybe <laughs> where like you just like life sort of takes over and you like you say you're not stopping and thinking about anything and for me it sort of manifests in my sleep I, I start sleeping quite badly because my thoughts are just racing too much and again it's like that joy kind of goes and you just feel like you don't you can't really get passionate about things because it's just too much um, and I think it's really hard and I think sometimes it does take for you to like, or like you get ill or, you know, something where you're like, oh, hang on, I need to just stop. And I think it's been really hard for a lot of people this year because we've not had a proper break since almost the start of the pandemic. Like we haven't gone on holidays like we normally would. We've, it's, it's just, I think it's sort of like 18 months worth of like nonstop and the stress of all that, that's like really getting to people now. Um, and I think, the thing that I try and do and I'm, I'm not always good at but firstly because I've got two young kids as well it's always like trying to keep those spaces separate so like if you are not working you're not working and that means if somebody calls you you set the boundary and you don't pick up yeah. and you don't and you don't worry about not replying to them because it's not the end of the world and you'll get back to them the next day um, and doing that kind of at weekends or evenings or whenever it may be um, and then trying to have a sort of policy of like it's always no unless it can't be a no so like when things are coming to you 
your standard response is I'm too busy and I can't do it. But if it's something where you would like seriously regret not doing it because of the team or the idea or whatever, then maybe you can break your rule. But if that's your like bar rather than it's yes, unless it's, you know, rubbish, whatever, then that's sort of, it's a different mindset. It's more like, no, the bars are up. I'm not taking anything on for now, but maybe something can sneak through if it's good enough. Um, I think sometimes it's helpful. Um, we've had a, a couple of questions in, um, and do please uh, send some more in if, if you've got any. Uh, Ranj, here's one for you. Uh, somebody from a, who works in an NHS lab but would like to work in TV. Um, do you think for you, your science background worked in, in your favour when applying? And for the rest of you, which I'll, I'll come to you in a second, you know, what skills might people have from outside the TV industry that could be really val for, uh, valuable? Yeah. Ranj, would you like to start? So for me, it was very relevant. The skills I had outside of media directly contributed to me being on uh, media platforms, being on television, as it were. Um, so for, for me, it was all about, I had to have credibility. So the role I was taking on on telly, even though it's kind of changed as time has gone on a bit, it was originally very much a medical advisor. So I had to have credibility, I had to have knowledge, I had to have skills, and I brought that back. And the great thing was um, that worked for me. So it kind of just lent, it supported me being there and people believed it. And therefore, you know, that was my in. That got me in there, interestingly. Um, but out, over time, obviously, that has changed. And I've started doing other little kind of things that aren't completely medical and kind of having a bit more sort of, uh, of a play with it. Interestingly, I bought those skills to here. But from here, from the media space, I've taken so much back so much back about working with people <laughs> and different kinds of people and recognizing different roles and how everything fits in the machine and uh, and and yeah just understanding a bit more about human beings and how they function because in in medicine we often get very insular we get very sort of boxed up thinking and we think that this is the entire world and we're <laughs> We live and breathe it, and, and that's how everybody thinks. Everybody's a doctor or a nurse. But, it, it, you know, the, the real world is not like that. And it's made me a much rounder, not physically, just physically, but <laughs> mentally a much rounder person. That's uh, uh, you, Kim. You know, what, what skills might somebody who's outside TV wanting to get in have already that they don't know are in demand? Oh, do you know what? I just think... There's so many other parts of yourself and your interests that you can plow into your work. You know, I think whatever your background, I mean, I, I, I do that with my writing. I don't, I don't think I've had the most interesting life. All, I, all I've known is really working in the media industry. You know, um, I don't have any super, super talents, amazing skills, you know, in other areas. But, you know, I try to explore part of my life like my Greek heritage and put that into my work um that kind of thing so I think you can bring you know it, it's really if you've got anything that you know that you want to talk about you know to create your own work define your own work and 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 put that in and and, and you get a much more authentic program out of that I think um so yeah I think everything's useful in, in program making, everything about ourselves, any interest you might have. I think as well, particularly in writing, I, it's sometimes um, youth. Oh. Uh, uh, oh. oh, sorry, lost. Yeah, go for it. Um, I'm sorry. I think in as a writer, sometimes it's useful. A really um, lovely writer who's British but now based in LA gave me this sort of advice once, of, like framing your lots of people are good writers and lots of people can technically write so it's about finding like what's your thing what's your voice what are the stories that you're telling and a lot of that does come from life experience like I've got a friend who studied neuroscience and now like everything she writes has a kind of like scientific sci-fi bend and she's exploring that and then there's other people who pick very specific things from their past and I've forgotten the name it's a very famous documentary mate filmmaker but there's like a quote that sometimes goes around which is sort of like go and work in a prison for two months, be a taxi driver. You know, like if you want stories and you want to tell stories, you have to live your life and you can't just spend your life in 
the industry because it's all just a bit samey. So like when people enter the industry and they've had a really interesting job, career, life, whatever beforehand, I think that's really exciting for people. And um, there's, so we've had another a question in here, uh, which I think is really interesting. So um, this is the this is sort of about the downside of being a slashy, I guess. So this person says that when they they feel like uh, people think they have a wishy washy CV, they, you know, if they're going for a writing job, well, there's people who've only done writing, so they've got loads more credits. If they're going for a producing job, it's the same. Um, Helen. Have you found yourself in that situation? What you know? What do you do if you're applying specifically for for a production job? Let's say. Well, so I'm lucky now that I don't really like I because I have a company. I'm just producing my own things. But when I was starting out, definitely to to the writing side, I was really wary of telling anybody that I was doing that, and it was kind of like what Rand said. Like I did, I wrote a short film which we made with the as of the other day Emmy award winning Brett Goldstein, who's lovely. And um, we made this little short and I kind of said that if it's rubbish and nobody likes it and it doesn't do anything, then I just won't. <laughs> or maybe I'll keep doing it, but in secret, but I'm not going to like say, announce that I'm a writer now. But if it does well, then I'll keep doing it. And so I kind of like secretly did it and then made it and then it did okay and slowly became more experienced and gained more jobs. And because at first I do think in this country compared to America, we like to box people and we like to say this is what you are and you can't leave that thing um out of fear out of like we don't want to show off I don't know what it is but it definitely feels like that in film and tv and so I was quite wary because I knew people might think it was a strange combination um so it was only as I sort of just had to keep proving myself and then I felt more comfortable saying it and I think sometimes it still is um a difficulty and I wouldn't but I think it's about collaboration. Like Kim says, it's like, if there's something where you're writing it, like bring another producer on. If you're producing something, most of the things we produce, we don't write, we work with other people. So it's about having the right hat in the right scenario and working with teams. So it's not just you. Like I would never apply to a financier with a film or a TV thing that I was writing and producing and nobody else was involved because that would just there's not enough voices in that there's no like counterbalance but in the right scenario if you're in the right teams then it shouldn't be a problem but I think yeah sometimes when you're starting out people can be a bit judgmental and they don't believe that you can do the thing you want to do until you've until somebody else has confirmed it um so it's definitely hard and you have to take a bit of a leap of faith and you have to maybe do you know make your own little thing to prove that you're, you can do it but uh, the more that other people sort of uh, back up your ability the easier it gets i think i think there's sort of there's a there's a, a, a difficulty you know right at the beginning of your career and sometimes the advice given is you know you have separate cvs for each of your your slashes i guess um is that something kim is that something that you've you've done do you know do you introduce yourself depending on who you're meeting as hi i'm a producer hi i'm an actor i do have a couple of alternative bio because yeah. i must admit <laughs> But you know what, I, I just think, you know, do know what you want to do, do it and define it yourself and don't let others put limits on it for you. I think be who you are. If you are a writer producer, I would say don't hide it. That's who you are. Those skills and that are useful. I just think all of those skills are useful and just, yeah, be confident in it. I think if you, if you are confident in those roles, or that people will see that confidence and realize, you know, you have extra things to offer on a project. And yes, someone might want you more for your writing than your producing on that particular project. But then, you know, for them to know at some point they can get, you know, you would understand the production side and they might just want to involve you in something or want your opinion in certain areas and they know you're equipped to do it. But I'd say just don't don't limit yourself don't let define yourself define yourself and be proud of that go for it what about sort of uh, i guess the other way so ranch you know you're if you're applying for a, a job at a hospital um do you ever worry that they'll go oh we're not going to want him he's, he's the tv doctor <laughs> well i actually worry that they might think i'm not going to take the medical job seriously 
Um, and that was a real concern at one point that people would look at my CV and say, oh, he doesn't really, he's not really into, he's not really serious about this as a career. He's just kind of doing it, even though it's a pretty tough career. And I don't know why anyone would do it like a hobby. Um, so, yeah, it's, so I, I, I find, though, it's, it's, it's a bit like Kim was just saying, is being confident. When people say no, you can't. Show them that you can. So I've done that throughout, like to medical people predominantly, who have said, oh, you can't do that. You can't do this and that. I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to bloody show you. And then, and then they're like, oh, right, we get it now. Um, and sometimes that's powerful, just being able to, to not just have the confidence and conviction to do it, but to actually go and do it and say, there you go, I did it. Told you so. And you get a great smug feeling from it. But, um, <laughs> but I now find that my um, extra colours now, as it were, um, now just add variety and flavor. And I, if I'm applying for a job, let's say, for example, I'm, I'm going to gear that CV towards that job and I'm going to put it at the top, the bit that is most relevant and important. But then I have all these other little bits just to back up, just to say, actually, do you know what? There's more to me than meets the eye. And I've done X, Y and Z and I can do X, Y and Z. And if you ever need it, you know, potentially I've got that insight or those skills. But this is the this is the big me. This is the proper me. And, and I've got these extra bits that I think just add a bit of flavour. Yeah. And do you think that, um, that, that's, you know, you mentioned before about actually your telly work informing your, your work outside of telly. You know, what skills are those that you've brought out? And do you think that might also apply to people who weren't, you know, part-time medic, part-time TV, or perhaps... <laughs> part-time something else, architect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, were, there might be lots of people with other, other jobs and careers and previous roles and other facets. Um, for me, what I learned from media predominantly was working with people. And my medical job is all about working with people, but in a very different uh, and a slanted way when it's in healthcare. But it was all about appreciating what real life people need and want, what they care about, you know, <laughs> you can learn so much from what people watch on telly <laughs> you know? and gain so much insight from that and it's just it was just learning about humanity and having a bit more humanity rather than being a, a, a clinical machine as I sometimes probably could be at work um, I just think it gave me a, a better insight into the world and how people tick um, and also communicating with them and recognizing different people doing different things and, and still valuing everyone just as much and knowing that we're all cogs in the big machine or everyone's got a role to play. And I think that it really taught me to value what other people bring. If it's not your thing, it may not be, you may not understand the role, but you understand the importance of it. And that it has, you know, that it, that, that it means something and it, and it contributes to the, to the final thing anyway. Yeah. Very nice. Um, Sonny, you know, as, as you've moved through your career, have you uh, encountered, I guess, any kind of resistance to that, that transfer between different roles? Um, I think the only resistance I've uh, maybe encountered is from myself in terms of imposter syndrome, um, thinking that I've moved from one discipline or career into another because I, I, I worked for ITV Studios making programs for six or seven years and then I moved into technology as a business analyst which was completely different and it took me about two years to really feel confident in meetings to kind of speak up and and, and uh, sound like I know what I was talking about uh, but that that fear came from within not from anybody telling me that I couldn't do it um, and that you know I was a business analyst for seven years never run any sort of operational team, was very kind of uh, working on projects, doing transformational projects. And then I went to run operational teams. And again, that, that imposter syndrome, that fear came back. All of a sudden I was in charge of people um, and uh, I'd never been in charge of people before. And um, yeah, again, it came from within. So it's, it's sometimes it's very difficult to, um, to, to, to push through that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, and it, you know, you can have a hundred people telling you, it's fine, you know, you're the right guy for the job. We wouldn't have chosen you if, you know, we didn't think that you could do it. But sometimes there's that voice inside you that goes, what are you doing here? You know, you, you can't do this. Uh, and it's about silencing that voice and, uh, uh, and pushing on through because uh, obviously I can do it because I, I am doing it. 
So it's a little bit like a reverse Lady Gaga, I think. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Kim, and, and I think to you, Sonny, but I'll start with you, Kim. Um, what about for people who, who want to get into TV, want to work in TV, but aren't based in London? Um, how, how, you know, how do they do that? How do they have those conversations? You mentioned Zoom earlier. You know, is it possible to get started in a trainee slash run a role uh, right at the beginning of your career outside of the big smoke? Yeah, it, it's absolutely possible. If it's what you want to do, you can make it happen. Not easy, but you can make it happen. And I think it is, it's reaching out to people, You're doing your research, do your research. Decide what you want to do and strategize, research how to get there. Who are the people that you want to meet? Write a list of all the names. Find out how you contact them, whether you're knocking on the door, if you can go local, if there's a local studio to you, a local production house you can knock on the door to, or is it finding out email addresses, you know, and trying to set up Zoom meetings. Just don't be scared to reach out to people. If it's what you want to do, I do believe you can make it happen, but you've just got to be bold and, and go for it. Reach out, ask people to help you. You know, people will help if you ask for it. And then, you know, you'll be moved on to the next person, then another person. Um, but it, I do think it begins with knowing what you, what you want and, and go from there decided what it is you want and what role you're, get, you're aiming for and who are the best people to help you. But talent is everywhere. We don't see it enough on the television. You know, I'm constantly rattling on and we don't see the Northeast enough on the television, but oh my God, the talent here is everywhere. And you know, it's around you. So um, it's on your doorstep, just reach out to people. Yeah. I think that's the point, right? You're not the only person in, the, in this case in Scotland, you're not the only person in your area who's very, very talented and looking to be creative or is being creative. And so find those people, find your tribe, as it were. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people don't, maybe don't realise how much there is available regionally. And I mean, it's true. A lot of stuff happens in London. It really does. And a lot of opportunities and positions will be there. Um, but there may be more local to you than you realise. And you have to face it, sometimes you may not get the first choice thing that you're looking for straight away, but you could potentially have a stepping stone to it. As Kim was saying, like, just knock on a door and ask. You might, I mean, I, I don't advocate people work for free, but if, if you need to, just to get a bit of experience to say, I've done something, then sometimes you have to bite the bullet and do that. If you're able to do that, you may have to do something that you perhaps isn't your, you know, top priority thing. Um, but you can certainly work your way to it. And maybe when you're in a, a different position in life or, or if you're able to be a bit more mobile, then you can potentially travel out to other areas and get the roles that you may want to do. But there's there's more, I think, around than people potentially possibly know. Yeah, th there's definitely more in the regions now than I think there ever has been. I think there is yeah. the, this move out of London. Uh, the BBC did it a few years ago. Channel 4 recently done it. Their, their uh, regional headquarters is in Leeds. Uh, yes. ITV has a base in Leeds and Manchester. So there is uh, things in the north. Um, you know, Screen Yorkshire does some great work in attracting um, films to come and shoot in, in Yorkshire. Uh, I think Yorkshire and uh, somewhere in Scotland was voted kind of the best places to, to film um, and there's TV programs like the Yorkshire Vet and the you know yeah. the, all these kind of stuff around the regions um, so so it is it is popular just going back to um, uh, what Kim was talking about in terms of being bold and being direct and really thinking about what you want to do um, you know because I get a lot of CVs from people and you know I feel sometimes they need some guidance and I, I want to help everybody because sometimes I just get these random CVs that says, I want a job in TV. I'm, I'm never going to reply to that to say, I'll give you a job in TV. But the ones that I'm interested in, the ones that say, I love ITV. I was watching this program last night. I know it came out of this building. Um, I, you know, the producer was this. I would love a chance to meet with that producer for a coffee. It's those sort of, those letters, those CVs that will get through, not the kind of scattergun approach of just give me a job in TV because I've just graduated. It, it will never happen. So be bold, uh, uh, be direct. 
know know what you're after and I think you know that, that that's very much your story right I think is it in broadcast that profile of you where you know you knew where you wanted to go can you tell us that very briefly yeah sure so when I was nine years old uh I, I drove past ITV Yorkshire and I asked my mum what goes on in that building and she says oh well, that's the building that makes the tv programs that you watch and I was like this is amazing I've got to get in that building somehow Fast forward, uh, what was I, 18? So fast forward kind of nine years later, uh, and I wrote them a letter. I did the scattergun approach, actually. I wrote them a letter saying, hey, give me some work experience. Uh, and they wrote back and they said, no, obviously. <laughs> uh, but then I, I wrote a letter to say, I want to make a documentary about what goes on in the newsroom. And they wrote back and said, oh, that, that's great. Yeah, come across. Um, so I, I took a camera. And I spent a week in the newsroom making a documentary about um, what goes in the newsroom, but the camera never had any taping. I never had any interest about actually making a documentary about the newsroom. All I wanted to do was get in that building and meet people and be nice to people and help. Uh, and that's how I got known within ITV. So when uh, I finished university, I wrote back to the people that I knew and uh, a job came up and uh, the rest is history. What that's were you going to do? So what were you going to do if they asked you to show you Show them the film. What were you going to do? I have no idea. <laughs> Lost the tapes. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> and it was in the days of tape as well, so, you know, I don't know. That's just it. Scam your way to the top. <laughs> um, but, well, it's, it, yeah, it's just, but it's yeah. about being, like, intelligent and smart and, and having a strategy about what you want and then having a kind of almost laser-like focus in terms of that's what I'm going to do. My mission was to get in that building uh, and I, I made it happen. Yeah, and then everything else kind of followed. You know, once you're there, you can then seize the opportunities that become available. And um, we're going to sort of wrap up now. So I want very quickly to come to each of you uh, for your number one piece of advice for a budding slashy. Um, Kim, let's start with you. You're at the top of my screen. I think it's important to define yourself. You know, go with the roles you want to do. Make it happen, and don't feel limited by what's out there you define the work you want to do. That's what I would say. Sunny, beyond fake documentaries, anything else? <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to operate outside of your comfort zone because everybody has to do it, you know? You're not going to be the only one that feels uncomfortable. Um, look left, look right. Don't always look in a linear fashion because there, there are other opportunities. Helen? I think... Um try and listen to your gut and like follow those itches rather than letting what other people want to define you as be what guides you I think if if at any point I'd listened to various people who were you know far ahead of me saying oh producers can't write or you can't be a producer at this age or you can't do you know listening to all those people who want to say what you can't do you wouldn't do anything so there's and there's lots of like brilliant people out there who will mentor you and be very supportive so find them but I think you have to kind of trust and try and just see what happens and not think before you've even started oh that can't be me um because there's lots of people who'd be happy to keep you as one thing and um you shouldn't do that Ranch, you're in a difficult position because all the great advice has been taken <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's all gone yeah as above uh, <laughs> um I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say what my, my, my weirdly, my life motto has been become. Uh, the first one is dream big, but don't be disheartened when it doesn't always work out. You know, don't be disheartened if you don't always get that first choice. Don't be disheartened when, you know, you've put your all into something and it just doesn't happen. Keep going. Um, work hard, but obviously, as we were saying, look after yourself. We're all knackered right now. We're all exhausted. We're all under incredible stress we've been basically going for 18 months non-stop um but yeah there's a, there's a lot to be said for working hard and really you know being brave and tenacious and and and, and being a bit of a go-getter especially in this industry and the final thing is be nice kindness goes so far especially right now i think everybody could do with a bit more kindness and like i said people will remember how you made them feel i built an entire career on being nice to people and I think that's the only reason they employ me. So, <laughs> so, so it really, really does matter. And you always remember the people that have been nice to you and you want to be that person. Fantastic. Well, I think that brings our session to an end. Thank you all so much. 
Um, I'll run through the panel now. So we've had Helen Simmons, we've got Sonny Hanley, we've got Kim Serkezi. Very good, spot on. Two for two. Uh, and we've got Dr. Ranj Singh. Thank you all so much. I really, really appreciate your time. And I think everyone who's been watching will as well. And hopefully we'll see you again at another RTS Futures session. And to the audience, uh, please come to the very next thing. There's nothing on the RTS website at the moment, but that doesn't mean there's not brilliant plans cooking behind the scenes. Um, so keep your eyes peeled. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.